All right, guys, this is Ms. Howell. I've got 15 minutes to get through this. I've got more words than there is time. So I'm going to talk fast, and that's going to leave it upon you to just hit pause when you need to. All right, so this time you're going to look for white words on the slide to fill in the blanks, and then go back and look at the stars to see if that will help you for studying for the test. Back in Module 7a last week, we learned a little bit about the nerve and the neuroglia. Now we're going to discuss a little bit about how these nerves carry signals to other parts of the body. When we talked about muscles back in Module 5, you learned that the electrical signal carried by an axon in a nerve is called action potential. So now we're going to try to understand what that means. Excitability is the ability to create an action potential in response to a stimuli. We have two types of excitable cells in the human body, muscles and neurons. Action potentials are electrical signals. It's an electrical disturbance of the cell membrane. This disturbance is measured across the membrane and it's called the potential difference and we can measure that in millivolts. There's a lot of fascinating details in the conduction of an impulse. Try really hard not to get discouraged, pause when you need to, and I'll try to make this as easy to understand as I can. First, remember that an axon is part of a neuron or a nerve cell. It's that long arm that carries an impulse away from the cell body. When no impulse is being conducted, we say the neuron has a resting potential. At rest, the neuron is negatively charged inside the membrane. The surroundings are positively charged. These charges are separated by the membrane itself, and we say that the membrane at rest is polarized. And that just means that those charges are separated. Negatively charged proteins that are too large to get out of the cell help maintain that inner negative charge. Also, the balance of sodium and potassium ions on either side of the membrane help maintain the potential difference. The cell membrane has a transport mechanism called the sodium-potassium exchange pump that moves these ions across the membrane via active transport. ATP energy is needed to run this pump. The ions move against their concentration gradient, therefore they have to be pumped across the membrane with ATP. While both of the ions are positively charged, exchanging them back and forth does alter the charge of the membrane because for every three sodium ions pumped out, there are two potassium ions pumped in. Additionally, the membrane itself is slightly permeable to potassium ions, so they're able to diffuse passively across the membrane and leak back out of the cell, further increasing the positive charge on the outside. The effect of this makes the resting potential of an axon negative. It's about negative 85 millivolts. And remember, even though we call it resting potential, ATP energy is still expended to keep it that way. So now we're going to move from rest to action. Action potentials are an all or nothing event. You either get one or you don't. You don't get a little action potential. A stimulus is needed to get an action potential. If you remember from Module 5 for skeletal muscles, it was acetylcholine that was the stimulus for the muscle action potential. So ACH was released from the axon in the neuromuscular synapse, but there are other synapses in the body and they have other neurotransmitters. So here's a list of stimuli that create action potentials. This is just a partial list. We have neurotransmitters like ACH and others, movement, your sense of touch, light, heat, chemicals, and electric shock. So what exactly is an action potential? It's just an interruption of the resting potential. The potential difference between the inside and the outside of the axon changes. This happens as a result of any of those stimuli that were in the previous list. The stimulus causes sodium channels in the membrane to fly open. This causes a rush of sodium ions to go into the cell because they had been housed in high numbers outside the cell. So diffusion moves these sodium ions from their high concentration outside to their low concentration inside until they reach an equilibrium. But this equilibrium of sodium leads to an overall positive charge within the neuron. This is called depolarization. To rebalance the situation, God has created a failsafe causing the potassium channel gates 
to fly open. This opens passageways for potassium ions to diffuse across the membrane from their high position on the inside to the low concentration outside. This is termed repolarization. Now the sodium and potassium are on the opposite sides of the membrane. To reestablish the original resting potential of the cell, the sodium and potassium gates close and the ATP driven sodium potassium exchange pump is utilized to return the membrane potential back to its negative 85 millivolts. And all of that movement occurs in just a few milliseconds. To recap, this is the correct order of steps in creating an action potential. Number one, sodium and potassium gates are currently closed. All the sodium ions, or most of them, are concentrated outside the cell, while potassium ions are concentrated on the inside of the cell. This is a cell with resting potential. Number two, a stimulus occurs. Number three, that makes the sodium gates open. Sodium ions rush into the cell according to the dictates of diffusion. We call this depolarization. Because of that, the sodium gates close and the potassium gates fly open. Potassium rushes out of the cell according to the dictates of diffusion. We call this repolarization. And at this point, the sodium and potassium gates close. Everything's on the wrong side, so the sodium-potassium exchange pump brings the system back to its original state. Remember, action potential is all or nothing. You either get one or you don't. So if a stimulus is strong enough to trigger an action potential, we call this a threshold stimulus. If it doesn't reach threshold, we call it a subthreshold. Once the threshold stimulus is reached, there's nothing that can be done to stop the action potential. No matter whether the stimulus is at threshold or way over, it's still going to produce the same action potential. So how does the body detect difference in stimuli? How can you tell the difference between, oh, warm water and very hot water, or soft music and really loud music? The intensity of the feeling or the sound does not depend on the size of the action potential. It's on the frequency of the action potential. Louder just means more frequent action potentials. Action potentials only travel in one direction along an axon. Well, how is that? A refractory period is the time in an axon when no action potentials can be produced because another is already in progress. A stimulus begins the change in the membrane potential. It begins at the axon hillock and moves forward down the length of the axon to the presynaptic terminals. All right, pay attention. We've mentioned something important here. There are two reasons that a stimulus does not result in an action potential. One is it's a subthreshold stimulus. It's too soft, light, little to make a response. The second one is the axon is already in use, so it's in its refractory period. The axon is in an absolute refractory period, so another stimulus can't happen, can't do anything. So how does the action potential actually travel down the axon of the nerve? Well, it depends on whether the axon is myelinated or unmyelinated. When there's a single Schwann cell that encases a group of several axons, we say that these axons are unmyelinated. And in that case, a continuous conduction of action potential moves straight down the axon. But if there are several Schwann cells encasing a single axon, then this axon is myelinated and a saltatory conduction occurs. Between each of these Schwann cells in a single axon is a node of Ranvier. Action potentials leap from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier at a much faster rate in saltatory than they would in a continuous conduction. Also, the diameter of the axon makes a difference too. The thicker the axon, the faster the action potential can travel as well. And we're going to diagram all this in class so it'll make more sense to you. Myelination by Schwann cells takes time after birth to occur. This is why infants have to have time to develop muscle control. Babies aren't born able to walk right away. Myelination of the nervous system begins in the baby's head and it works its way down and out throughout the body.
One of the first developmental milestones of an infant occurs when a baby can first focus their eyes. In a few weeks, they display their first smile. Holding up their head comes a little while after that. It can take up to a year before there's enough myelination to occur, allowing a baby to coordinate the nerves and muscles to take their first steps. Potty training can take sometimes three years to accomplish because the nerves of the bladder are the last to myelinate. So again, here's that question I keep pointing out. A stimulus on a neuron does not result in an action potential. There's two reasons why this might happen. What are they? Go back and look at your notes and write that down in your guided note sheet. All right, so far we've moved down a single axon. Now we need to discuss how does the signal travel across a synapse. The first neuron in line is the presynaptic neuron. Then the axon releases neurotransmitters from the presynaptic terminal across the synaptic cleft to start an action potential in the membrane of the next postsynaptic neuron. These synapses can either be excitatory or inhibitory. Let's look at both of these. The purpose of the synapse is simply to regulate signal flow. If exactly the same amount of action potential is needed from the stimulus to the response, synapses wouldn't be needed. At the terminal end of the first axon, the action potential opens calcium channels that trigger the release of the neurotransmitters like ACH. These neurotransmitters cross the synaptic cleft and bind to the postsynaptic receptors. That triggers the opening of the sodium channels that begins the action potential of the second neuron. In the excitatory synapse, a lot of neurotransmitters are needed to open enough sodium channels to create action potentials of equal frequency. Therefore, Several action potentials on the presynaptic side are required to create equal frequency action potentials on the postsynaptic neuron. If there's too few presynaptic potentials, then the frequency of the action potential on the postsynaptic neuron will be lower. The majority of the synapses in the body are inhibitory, while the excitatory synapse involves neurotransmitters that open sodium channels on the postsynaptic side. The inhibitory synapse neurotransmitters bind to receptors that open potassium channels. Well, why does this matter? Well, opening potassium channels allows potassium from the inside to rush out. This causes the outside to become more positively charged than the inside, which further reduces the negative charge on the inside. This pulls the charge further away from threshold, and it's called hyperpolarization. Hyperpolarization decreases the chance for an action potential. That's why it's inhibitory. So to recap, Excitatory opens sodium channels. Inhibitory opens potassium channels. The last thing in this module that we need to talk about is the way that the neurons are arranged. There's three different ways you need to know. There's converging circuits, means more than one presynaptic neuron attaches to one postsynaptic neuron. All your messages go in one way. Second is diverging circuit in which there's one input but it diverges to connect with two or more different neurons. An example would be when you burn your hand. There's a single signal traveling from the hot surface up your hand but that diverges into two signals. One of those tells you to respond with a reflex to yank your hand back but the other processed by your brain helps you learn not to touch a hot stove again. And the last one of these is the oscillating circuit in which a neuron sends a signal down the line but it kind of repeats it back to itself to prolong the effect of the signal. In the next modules we're going to look more at the details of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. I know this has been a lot. We will do a lot of diagramming and talking in class. I'll see you next Monday.